Ankylosaurs are ubiquitous in any Cretaceous scene. But little is known about them, that's thanks to their armor falling off their bodies as soon as they die, taking the rest of their bones with it. The best ankylosaur specimens found themselves in large bodies of water, where the decaying body would bloat with gases, explode, and sink to the bottom to become blanketed in silt for the maximum freshness. Some other good ones were overcome by sandstorms or moving dunes, swallowed in the coarse stuff instantly. Shy halud, they were not. Despite this seemingly iffy fossil record, these critters were evolutionarily diverse. The ankylosaur family is constantly in flux, with new members being found at a moderate frequency. It's currently divided into the great Parankylosauria and Euankylosauria groups. Parankylosauria is a new group holding just three very bizarre southern hemisphere animals. Euankylosauria is the more well-known and broader group of northern hemisphere animals. It's further chunked up into the Notosauridae, a bunch of clubless, relatively spiky, smaller-bodied ankylosaurs, and the Ankylosauridae, the super-wide, super-armored, clubbed varieties you may be most familiar with. Of course, this group can be organized further into the Chamosaurinae, just two Mongolian oddballs, and the Ankylosaurinae, a large group of the most iconic armored dinosaurs. But something is off about this group across time. Ankylosaurs are known from the late Jurassic to the very end of the Mesozoic, but they are most common and diverse in the late Cretaceous. Those found in the mid-Cretaceous, therefore, offer many important bits of data for a greater understanding of ankylosaur evolution. Ankylosaurs from the mid-Cretaceous tend to be mostly Asian, with many not definitively being true ankylosaurines. Many researchers think the mid-Cretaceous ankylosaurs evolved from the transitional forms between early and late Cretaceous ankylosaurs. As the group evolved from one form to another, many offshoot lineages evolved to fill in different ecological niches before being replaced by late Cretaceous true ankylosaurines. However, the exact transition among these animals is poorly understood anyway, so hypotheses are always being reworked. A new mid-Cretaceous ankylosaur would help shed some light on these evolutionary relationships. It's a good thing one of those has recently been described. Paleontologists Lita Xing, Gecheng Niao, Jordan Milan, and Tetsuto Miyashita published their work on a new ankylosaur in the Vertebrate Anatomy Morphology Paleontology Journal in early 2024. According to the paper's text, the new material is a pair of critters found in Majo, Huichang County, Yangshi Province, People's Republic of China, approximately 90 kilometers east-southeast of Ganshou City. The story of their discovery goes all the way back to 2016, when construction crewmen spotted unusual white bones poking out of a giant boulder as it set in a rubble pile after the destruction of the surrounding rock. A team of paleontologists from Yangliang Stone Natural History Museum got the dinosaur fossils in 2018 and began preparing and studying them. Li Da Xing, the paper's lead author, went back out to the area to scope for more fossils, double check that it was where the fossils came from, and make official scientific documentation of the geologic setting. This proved that the specimens came from the Zhou Shen formation of the Ganzhou group, making the dinosaurs 96 to 90 million years old, the Turonian to early Coniacian ages. Technically, this window of time is within the late Cretaceous epoch, as there is no official mid Cretaceous. Still, many paleontologists take the end of the early and start of the late Cretaceous to compose the unofficial mid Cretaceous epoch. So, what all was found, and what kind of cool name did they give it? In all, the material is of two individuals, the holotype specimen, which is the most complete and important specimen used to name the genus and species, in this case, specimen YLSNHM01002, is the noggin, the front of the spinal column before the pelvis, the vertebrae from the very end of the tail, the shoulder girdles, the left arm, a chunk of the left pelvis, the end of the right femur, and some armor from the trunk area. On the other hand, the paratype specimen is any other fossil usually found related to the more important one with the same traits, making it most probably of the same type of animal but of another individual. In this case, that specimen is YLSNHM01003 and comprises a noggin, another slew of vertebrae from the front of the animal, the shoulder girdles, the left elbow, and osteoderms from the trunk. 
With all these bones collected, prepared, and described, the research team was confident that they had a new animal on their hands, so they gave it the name Datai, or Detai, Ying Liangis. The authors write in their paper that the Tai, a composite of the last character or syllables each from Tongda to understand or to be sensible, and Antai or stable in Chinese Pinyin, while Yingliangis is in recognition of the Yingliang group. The Yingliang Stone Natural History Museum is operated as a public museum by the philanthropic program of the founder Liang Liu of the Yingliang group, and the type specimens are curated in this museum in Shuitu, Fujiang, China. Now that we know its name, what do we know of its appearance? Detai is not unusual in appearance for an ankylosaur. Though the back ends are missing, the front ends don't show anything particularly crazy going on. They were wide animals with a suit of keeled osteoderms organized in neat rows across the body from their neck to the tip of the tail, which likely would have been tipped in a bony club like all other members of this group. One of the few features one may more easily use to tell Detai apart from other ankylosaurs is that it had two bony horns on the side of the skull or cheek. This is not seen in any other armored dinosaur ever found. Unfortunately for the rule of cool, they aren't particularly large, so the critter doesn't look like a four-horned bison. However, since the rule of cool is made to be broken, I still think the double cheek spikes are neat. The Datai skull is arrowhead shaped, with a big fat back and a rather thin beak, indicating the critter may have been a little more particular about what type of foods it ate. A wider snout often correlates to a more generalized ecology, the better to eat as much as possible as easily as possible. Another interesting thing to note is that both specimens were buried quickly enough after death that small polygonal osteoderms are preserved along the neck. These little bits of bone, which would have lay beneath the skin, are called guler osteoderms. They are found in both stegosaurs and ankylosaurs, but are quite rare due to how small they are and how apparently easily it was for them to separate from one another and the animal's neck after death. This is also why very few armored dinosaurs are displayed with their neck armor. There are instances of this armor found in ankylosaurs, but one might be more familiar with the armor in stegosaurs, due to some particularly memorable museum displays that show the armor. For example, the Allosaurus vs Stegosaurus display at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Very few museums do the same for their ankylosaurs, and I have yet to see an example of one, though no doubt one must exist. Before we move on, let's bring in Mr. Man from Animal Planet's The Most Extreme to get an idea of Datai's size. After some cook baths and the rest of the animals are filled in from close relatives, paleoartist Paleohistoric has given a size estimate of around 5.5 to 5.8 meters or 18 to 19 feet in length. That's around medium size for ankylosaurs. Thanks, Mr. Man. So, what the heck even was Datai? Thanks to the tumultuous nature of the evolutionary relationships of ankylosaurs, the author team decided to use two different analyses based on the work of two groups of researchers. In one analysis, Datai stands on its own as an offshoot lineage among the ankylosaurinae, right before the split-off of the two known Pinacosaurus species. In a second analysis, Datai is an early offshoot of the same lineage that split off into the Pinacosaurus species. Either way, Datai is a relative of Pinacosaurus, but to different degrees. Datai has some features that the researchers think may belong to a juvenile animal, but no histologic analysis was done on any of the fossils. This means the animals could be young or have adult traits more often seen in the juvenile forms of other ankylosaurs. One of the specimens was originally found with its head lying atop the head of the other. This may or may not reflect the animal's behavior before death, but it does sort of line up with evidence of such behavior preserved in a small group of young Pinacosaurus from Mongolia. And that's Datai. Like many mid-Cretaceous ankylosaurines, its world was lush with flowering and coniferous plants dotting the soil while lakes, rivers, and deltas sliced across the land. Invertebrates, many of which resembled those with us today, crept and crawled. The recently described giant titanosaur, Gandhi Titan, left giant footprints akin to tide pools in its wake, while large carnivorous dinosaurs such as early tyrannosaurs or late surviving allosauroids snacked on their juveniles. Perhaps small, frillless horned dinosaurs frantically ran about the forests for things to eat. 
and a whole cornucopia of raucous color and feathers filled the canopies. Not many vertebrate remains are known from the Jotian formation, but eggs of theropod dinosaurs are, and they indicate a vibrant region with many types of parrot dinosaurs. Only more fossils from this chunk of time and space will flesh out the lives of these animals. What will come next? For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.